about your character? Oh, from this you? is a great, this is a good filler. Good question, Darren. Um, so yeah, so the, the, the picture is not actually, it is the character I believe is, um, her name is Venom. I forget whether she's DC or Marvel. Um, but that's, it's not actually a video game character. It is a real life little figurine model. And there's a great story behind this. Um, so back in 2013, um, I had, before I started the Aquia, I'd been contributing for core, to core for maybe a year and a half. Um, and I did a patch review of a 400 plus kilobyte patch to convert the Drupal 7 block system um, and all of the blocks in core to the new plugin API. Um, and after, so I did this patch review, I spent 120 total hours reviewing the code um, in this 400K patch. And so Yves Chazemois, who the maintainer of CCK um, and the field API told me that he was going to build a statue of me. Um, which, you know, was great. And I laughed at the time that was in January. And then four months later at DrupalCon Portland, um, he came up to me and said, well, we looked into building the statue, but it turns out the cost was kind of prohibitive to build it at, you know, a real life scale. Um, so we had to miniaturize it and he presented me this actual figurine. So it is, it is still on my desk. It could be James. I'm like, I wasn't actually familiar with it. Um, I think it's just the, uh, you know, the, the gun slinging and, and her lasso and our whip there was very appropriate since um, I love it. hurting a lot of what I do. So, yep, there, there's that's why it's my icon. Um, See, I've never even heard that story either. Thanks, Darren. Good question. Uh, yeah, the, the Sprint Peter is from Drupal Dev Days Seged. Um, in, in 2014, where and it's the entity field API chart since it was Eve that gave me the statue. So um, that's those are all of the the beta blockers for Drupal 8's entity field API that we were working on at that sprint. We have another casual question before we start off. I, I last time I got a haircut was in the summer. <laughs> that's that pandemic life. Yeah. Um, all right, we're almost at the official start time. Um, plenty of folks. Um, so I think maybe we'll get started here. Um, I'm going to try and moderate um, a little bit. Um, great. You, you got the introduction from over on um, the actual keynote itself in terms of who's involved in this initiative, and of course. Um, if you're here, we would also love for you to be involved as well. Um, uh, we can uh, repost some of the links if you need them to the uh, open social contribution tables or to the Drupal Slack with the auto updates channel. Um, and we'll make sure to get you everything that you need. But yeah, thank you for joining us. Jumping right into questions. Um, so Jess, you captured this one because it was asked during the main stage. Um, will the auto update system require the web server to be able to write files that it's then going to execute? This is via Brian Weaver, who wants to tackle the actual file uh, so, portion. So yeah, they'll, this will be a requirement it, um, for hosting providers that want to integrate this. They'll have to, you know, find a solution that works for them. Uh, maybe mean applying an update in a different environment and moving it over. We will not support, Core does not directly support like dev stage prod different environments. Um, it only deals with one particular um, Drupal site. Um, so for the long tail of sites that, you know, really, I think part of the, the partially the main focus of our, or sites that we're really trying to go after um, are not only, I guess the ones that we're directly supporting in core the use case, we will require the file system to be writable. Um, but there will be events, you know, before the update, so you could potentially um, change that, you know, through a module, through custom code, as far as making it writable just for the brief part of the update. But core, to, right now the plan is core to not support that directly. That will be one of the readiness checkers to make sure that um, you know, the file system can be written to, and hosting providers can also, or, you know, anybody can write new readiness checkers. Say if, you know, if you have custom code that gets around that somehow, you could also probably write a custom readiness checker to check, you know, the, the status that you need for your file system. 
And I'm pretty sure um, the contributed, the Drupal 7 tarball contributed module already includes a checker to may verify that the file system is writable um, to make sure that the, the updates can be downloaded. So we'll, we'll probably include that um, that checker in core as well. Um, and then the, the core automatic updater would enable it by default for the long tail sites that don't, um, as Ted said, build out their own um, workflows. But then obviously a, a more advanced hosting platform will not want the file system to be writable, but can integrate with using the APIs that are available, including the readiness checks. Like you can also, um, the readiness checks are extensible. So hosting providers can add their own. Awesome, great. Um, and I was remiss, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention, of course, at the beginning of the session, if there's anyone in the audience who needs captioning for this panel discussion, um, and I'll place this in the chat as well, so it's not invisible, uh, you can caption using the tip in the main event Q&A feature for enabling Chrome accessibility live captioning. Um, so let me go ahead and post that there. Uh, there's a related question to this conversation about hosting providers. Um, so do the major Drupal platform providers, so if it folks like Aqua or Pantheon, um, have plans to support auto updates within their environments? So we have people from Aqua here. We have people from Pantheon working on the initiative. Um, I guess we can, you know, say more about we've been working with our cloud team on how we can support this and what parts. Um, it's definitely, you know, when we're looking at op adding automatic updates to our platform, we're planning on leveraging this. It probably would not be the same way that a site, say, on shared hosting would leverage this. But we'll we'll use um, we will use this system. That's the plan currently. Uh, speaking as a, a small site maintainer for a Drupal campsite that's hosted on Aquarius Dev Cloud platform, it would be really nice if if it, if it was supported. So. Um, it makes life easier for, for event organizers. Yeah. And, and definitely, um, you know, it's, it's in a, it's in a uh, hosting provider's best interest to support it because if shared hosting has automatic updates available, but then the big hosting providers don't, that, that, that would be a competitive disadvantage. So there's definitely incentive in making sure that once core supports yeah. this, we can as well for, for customers with, with much, you know, uh, broader needs. Yeah, I mean, I think there's there, some oh, go ahead, Tim. No, go ahead, Tim. I was just going to say, there's some related questions here about, oh, well, gosh, would enterprise scale hosting and people with their own CI and CD pipelines be getting some kind of advantage from this feature? And certainly those audiences um, can use the whatever best practices they've already implemented for managing their own updates and continue to do that. Uh, but that said, there are elements of this that perhaps they may want to use, and it's being built so that it's going to be extensible, both to enable these hosting providers to, to kind of hook into it and make sure it works the way that they need it to work. Perhaps they need, need to extend readiness checks to some other elements of what they're doing, or perhaps they want to use part of this system, but not the whole thing in you know their built-in CI CD pipelines or in their built-in dev stage prod processes. Um, there might be a way that they want to use some or all of what's going on here. So we're hoping to make it um, uh, a flexible architecture. Um, but yes, that primary audience is we want all of the um, all of the sort of set and forget site owners out there to be able to to really do that, to actually be able to get their patch and security updates without having to um, attend quite so closely. So you, you could also potentially, like, if you have a system for that you use for applying updates now, you could potentially integrate the Composer integration with our PHP Tough library to, to add to that system. Basically, if you added the dependency in the Composer integration plugin, you would get secure downloads um, by default if you used it. So you would have to change very little of your current workflow for applying updates. But you know, for some people, that may be the most important part of this initiative is a more secure composer to make sure that um, the sources are, you know, are much harder to compromise. Another question that came from the main stage was, how close are we to um, getting this initiative ready for inclusion in Drupal 10? Um, what's, what's sort of our subjective feeling about how we're how we're coming along here do you want the pessimistic release manager answer or do you want the optimistic engineering answer <laughs> i want both kind of <laughs> um, I, I want to range, right 
Um, <laughs> so uh, I, I would say we th this this initiative. Um, we didn't really cover it in the keynote, but it's worth noting that this initiative already includes years of work. Um, in 2017 and 2018, there was a lot of um, thought leadership and planning done, especially by Peter O'Lannan and David Strauss. In 2019, the European Commission sponsored the development of the Drupal 7 updater that's available for tarballs. Um, the, the Drupal 7 updater, it, it doesn't obviously include composer integration, um, and it, it doesn't include the sort of like um, safe update staging um, that Ted was discussing at this point. But it does include, um, this is something that Peter actually wanted us to mention, it does include package signature verification already using um, a PHP port of the CSIG um, signatures. So it's not the full tough spec but that is available now. Um, so that happened in 2019. Um, we, we spent a bunch of time this year um, because there were, there's discovery that we did around CSIG um, we, there, there's some problems that we ran into and when, when we were developing it that tough solves for us. And so that's why we're building that out now. Um, right, so that's like, like thinking about the timeline on that. We've, um, I think that there's a lot, there is a lot of work left in this initiative. Like um, of the things, you know, you saw Ted slides, a lot of, a lot of this right now is still theoretical or very early prototypes uh, and uh, we want, obviously, we want this to be as secure as possible. We want it also to be as stable as possible because something else that, you know, an update system can do is it, it not only can it um, be a security attack vector, but it's also just a really great mechanism to break a site, right? This is why we've spent so much time thinking about the running SGX API and so forth. Um, so we really want to be careful before we release it in core. Um, I think that, you know, I, it would, it, I, a stretch goal would be to get um, an ex the experimental core integration done by the deadline for 9.3. Um, I think that's ambitious right now. Um, you know, they even even with all of the the great contributors who are spending a lot of time on this initiative right now, I think that's that's there's still a lot of work left to be done um, because you know all of this is brand new code and and for the especially for the composer integration parts, we're doing things that haven't really been done before. Um, for securing updates and making them compatible with the CMS. We're also, you know, sort of solving the problem of composer updates and Drupal modules at the same time, right? Like right now, Core doesn't even acknowledge the fact that composer exists for the most part, or at least the, the module system doesn't, right? So um, we have to solve all of those problems as well um, while still supporting tarballs for the people who are using tarball sites still. So that, yeah, there's a lot of stuff to do. Um, but on the other hand, we do, uh, because the automatic update system isn't just a feature per se, it is like a security hardening, um, we might be able to continue to work on it um, in 9.4 and 10.0 simultaneously. So even, even if it's not ready by that deprecation deadline that Dries presented yesterday in October, um, there is still the chance that we could get something done um, a year from now. Even if, uh, if that was my question. Months, so. Thank you, Jess. So yeah. that, I was wondering if we could work on it in 9.4, uh, even though it's, you know, that deadline approaches for 10.0. Yeah, for, for most things, um, like we can't introduce new deprecations. Um, so like things like deprecating the, the tarball downloader, we wouldn't be able to do anymore in 9.4. Um, because of the, the difficulty that causes for Drupal 10 updates, but for the rest of it, um, you know, unlike most features, this is, you know, this is, this isn't just new minor release development. This is, this is fundamental um, security stability of Drupal's platform. So hope that was kind of long winded. I wanted to give you some context for how much, just like when we say, oh, it's, we talked about all of this and then it's still going to take a really long time. You then we've talked about it for five years, but hopefully. But I would say also the timeline is probably dependent on, you know, uh, or it could be ex not only accelerated, or the timeline obviously is like how many people are contributing. So if you're interested in contributing, you know, you could affect that timeline. Uh, so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and we definitely right now need more diversity right now in the in terms of yeah. who's funding the initiative. Right now, the Drupal Association is investing a lot. Um, Pantheon is making a pretty dedicated investment, and Acquia's investment in this is huge right now. 
um, it'd be really great to, to get more companies um, who can give us some developer time to make this happen because, um, you know, it, it, Acquia could decide tomorrow that Ted and I need to solve some Acquia problem and that would also affect the timeline. So, so we, we need you. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, we have a couple of related sort of composer questions here, um, one of which is perhaps a little bit of a softball here from Damien, but on a scale of one to one million, <laughs> um, how much does Composer 2 make this whole thing easier and, and more feasible? Like what, what was so significant about Composer 2's release in making this possible? And, um, and uh, why is that important um, to, to being able to do this and even the Project Browser initiative that was proposed? So the memory requirements are huge, or the, the, the lowered memory requirements. So we want to do this um, you know, in a web request. Um, so that is pro probably, even if all the other stuff that we're getting solved in Composer 2 didn't happen, I think probably the memory requirements would stop it on most hosting in Composer 1. Um, and then I think <clears throat> just generally the way Composer is written, um, we would not have access to the downloads in the way that we do in Composer uh, 2. So we could potentially make a system in Composer 1 probably that we would have access to the downloads after the fact. But um, Composer 2, it's going to be easier for us to sort of get in the chain of like the download of the packages to um, uh, to protect against like denial of service attacks where somebody would send like a stream, like the in the stream for particular packages or, or uh, metadata. Um, so that we can cut, you know, the tough, what a part of the tough requirement is for the tough specification, like all the files that are targets in the update framework, you know how long they're supposed to be. And if that stream exceeds that, then you don't, you know, you don't tell them, you don't finish downloading and check the hatch, you just abort at that point. Um, so the flexibility um, that, uh, and that we're really getting in in the composer right now so we may actually be dependent on like the point release of composer but like just said with the timeline um that we're looking at that probably won't be an issue um or it'll be an issue but by that time it'll be fine um so yeah not not possible in composer one probably yeah and you know just a general composer two is just so much more practical for everything related to um smaller site owners, shared hosting, yeah. that whole thing. Um, Adam, it, it seemed like maybe you had some comments there related to Composer as well. Did you want to jump in? I mean, I would second what Ted said, oh, where um, the memory requirements of Composer 1 are probably a problem for us. And it's also, I mean, I haven't, I don't, you know, with Composer 2 being out and not painful to use or not as painful, I don't want to freaking touch Composer 1 anyway. So. Um, I don't know if Composer 1 has the APIs that we're using. It Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Either way, we did need to make a few small changes to Composer 2, and those changes only got merged into Composer 2 anyway to get this to work. So I, I don't know why we would want to mess with Composer 1 anyhow. Let's let's just bury it. Drupal 10 also so it won't support Composer 1, keep in mind. So. Yeah, Great, let's bury it. So there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Um, so then the second sort of composer related packet, it's kind of combination composer tough and Drupal.org question. So Peter asks, so what is, how is Drupal.org actually integrating with these composer packages to create this sort of tough signing when it comes to third party packages that Drupal.org isn't hosting directly? How is that working and, and how are we managing that? Oh, I would love uh, to tell you about that. <laughs> Wait, go ahead, Ted. No, I was just wondering if like uh, David or Neil is on around. If they... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, we can answer it. But, uh, <laughs> I think the people here may they might have they might have some more yeah. thoughts. But uh, why don't you why don't you kick it off? Oh, there, there's oh here comes, here comes hey. Neil. So yeah, I'm Neil uh, Drum, one of the uh, people on the Drupal.org engineering team. Uh, so yeah, we are architecting. Uh, David has done has done a lot of the thought here. Uh, architecting a server which will, uh, once a package is requested, any composer packages.org or drupal.org package, uh, put it in a queue and get it signed. Uh, we're signing on behalf of packages. So uh, there is a little bit of a handoff there. And uh, 
we, you know, we want to build this in a way that we can uh, shift the whole infrastructure over to packages.org if we build something that um, works with their infrastructure. And yeah, the actual signing itself will be mostly Python code uh, since the tough reference implementation that we'll use is, is Python. And yeah, it's just stringing together a bunch of queues and HTTP requests. Yeah, so I think one thing... Sorry, go ahead. Okay, well, the, the only thing I want to say is like, you know, in case it's not clear, like part one of the requirements of the Composer integration is that we need to be able to validate packages that are coming from places on the internet that are not D.O. So we are going to be checking, you know, partially this happens on the, as Neil mentioned, on the server side with of uh, D.O. and it'll also happen with Composer where we will validate stuff that comes from the rest of the internet from packages and stuff like that. Yep. And we're, we're validating every HTTP request that Composer makes. So downloading the Composer metadata, downloading the, uh, the file, the tarballs themselves, uh, the, there might be like a bootstrapping where uh, the initial metadata about the packages or Drupal or repository says, yes, everything's signed with tough signatures are over on this server. Yeah, so we'll go into a little bit of this more in the technical overview, but one thing, I mean, kind of the basic of, of the need for the update framework is that we really can't trust for different hosting providers um, they're, I guess we would call the TLS chain. So there, if we could trust always that they could make secure requests, we wouldn't need a lot of this. But, um, you know, for, for different hosting, it's, it's really hard to tell if we can trust that. So Drupal eventually will ship with this root.json file that is um, the update framework specifies, and that will have a set of keys, and we can, we can update those keys and rotate them, but basically, we're kind of pushing the trust onto the Drupal.org infrastructure for making requests. So instead of like every Drupal site making a request to download something and having to re have to trust that request, um, it's like what sort of a smaller point of trust of like something making a request and signing it is the Drupal.org infrastructure, not your particular site and your particular hosting. That's my understanding. Thanks, all. Um, we have a question from Ben here. Um, so there's a lot of sites that are applying patches, um, and there's you know the Composer patches plugin. What kind of thought has gone into how you handle updates if there's patched files and those sorts of things? We, I, I mean, I would. I can speak to very far on that. Oh, you have. Okay, great. I mean, <laughs> so everything I'm about to say has not been tested. So this is all theoretical based on just my rooting around in the guts of this stuff. But the way I understand how, like the patcher I think everybody uses is uh, C. C. Wiggins Composer patches. And um, the way I understand that plugin works is it only applies the patches after Composer has downloaded a thing. So what, will ha what happens is Tuff sits between those two points where Composer does the download, Tuff checks it, and then release Composer and the other plugins to do whatever it wants. That's what I think it would do. I have to confirm that that's what it would do, um, but it definitely needs to work with patches. So that, that would be my guess there. Um, but I it does need to I, I think future. also the, the, like, the Composer patches will probably need to, it may need to add its own integration for the Composer staging plugin. Um, I see Travis joined, so maybe he can speak to this, but I was just gonna um, briefly say, um, you know, we, the, what what happens, what what's going to happen right now is that um, all of the updates get downloaded in a temporary directory and then copied over so that instead of um, having to wait for the entire Composer dependency evaluation and so forth, you, the files only get copied once we're sure that, first of all, there weren't any errors in the composer build process, um, and also that, that all of the packages were downloaded and the signatures matched and so forth. Um, so if, if the patches don't apply, then the build would fail. And so at that point, um, I think that composer patches would want, want to ensure that the updates are not copied over and inform the user um, that they have a patch that no longer applies after following the update. So. That's something I can see happen. Yeah, Travis, that's accurate. And if, I can, if I can offer uh, another perspective on the same answer, 
the question of patches is a matter of just the ordinary composer stuff. Um, the composer staging, which is the part of the process that um, kind of moves the composer updating work outside the live active directory and then moves it back in when it's all done so that failures won't uh, bork the live site and long running composer commands won't take your site down or offline for their duration. <clears throat> this composer stager doesn't, unlike the uh, composer tough integration, which is literally a composer plugin, the stager is a completely separate tool. It doesn't get into composers innards. It doesn't really have any effect whatsoever on things like your uh, custom installer paths or patches or anything else that you may be using that affects your ordinary composer uh, workflow and functionality. And so for that reason, you can consider that effectively irrelevant. Um, in other words, it, if you do it now, it will continue to just kind of work the same way. They mentioned in the chat that there's maybe a problem with composer patches like failing silently. So obviously we'll need to, I mean, right now we're not in, we're, we're not working any improvements to the composer patch flow, but we may need to look at that. Obviously that's, you know, not acceptable for an update to, to should apply a patch, but it doesn't for some reason and just could totally ignore it. Keep in mind that core does not support the notion of, of having core patched and the core will include a readiness check that verifies that core is not patched, that it, mm. it matches. Um, so for, for the long tail site implementation, um, by default, that readiness check will say, hey, you're not ready for an update. Um, and then if someone, you know, for, for many site owners that do need to run patches against core or against contrib, um, the, that that tool will probably need to, or whatever tools they're using, will need to um, turn that readiness check off and then replace it with their own relevant um, verification. The remark that cool. patches fail uh, if, or, or patching fails if the Linux patch or GNU patch or whatever is not installed in the shell uh, does kind of point back to that fact that those details are not going to be changed whatsoever by the composer staging operations. Uh, if if you already have if it's already silently failing on your current live application, it will continue to silently fail when you stage updates. If it is not failing silently, if it's throwing errors when there are patch failures on the live application, it will behave the same way in the in the staging operations it will cause them to fail to really uh, innards wise really uh, it's it's a, a lift and shift it just copies your whole active application active directory into a temp directory and then it just goes into that temp directory and performs your composer update or other composer commands and then it R syncs it back into the live or active directory. Cool. So, you know, unfortunately we've sort of reached the end of our time and I do still see some great questions here. You to we bring have five more minutes, sort of... right? Don't we? Oh, do we? Oh, got, got gotcha. Five minutes or four minutes now. So maybe we can get like one or two more questions in, but probably should. Perfect, let's do that. Time. So re related to additional sort of questions about I, I don't know if patches this is totally an edge case considering how common it can be, but other sorts of cases. What about updates that include um, database updates? Um, how do you handle a sort of an up B situation? And how would you handle um, the config that might go along with it, particularly if you need to commit that configuration somewhere? Um, so the, the second part, the committing changes or whatever, that's the responsibility of the person building out the workflow. Um, so if your workflow currently involves a commit before deployment, presumably that will be the same case when you integrate on um, the automatic updater. But 
uh, for for the the first part, the database updates. Um, we have a policy right now that that anything that includes an update hook should be include deferred to a minor release if possible. Um, we avoid having any hook update n or post updates in patch releases in general um, and in security releases uh, because you know they're they're disruptive. Um, so as much as is possible, we we want like we just want to prevent that situation from existing. But should there be a security update that does require a database update, um, in that situation, um, we would we would need to we can't figure that out before we download the update. We have to check afterward to see whether the schema version is different. Um, and then that that's another thing that might need to be configurable on a case by case basis. Like if you're on shared hosting, you have 100, 200 nodes, no big deal. You can run any database update in production. That's fine. You don't care. But if you have a million nodes on your site, you can't run a hook update and safely. And so you might need to schedule it. Um, so that's another thing where the readiness checks come in. And that's also another thing where um, the, the enterprise use cases will need to um, you know, take advantage of our APIs to write the appropriate workflow for them. Great. Let's see here. So. One more question, I think. I think we've got, and we've got quite a few good ones here. Um, um, how will site owners be able to manage it if they have their own internal libraries, particularly if they're using a private packagist? Is that going to have problems doing, say, validation of packages or something like that? Um, we, so, we did discuss this in in one of our thought sessions about this, and we kind of recognized that. Um, there will be packages in the tool chain that we ha that may not be signed. Um, we have to allow that case to exist um, because, um, you know, your your own custom code on your site is part of your composer build, presumably, and we can't we can't sign that for you. So um, it won't it won't prevent it from working. We we just sort of recognize that we have to allow that circumstance to happen. Yeah, and these are all signed on a per composer repository basis. So if you're using a private packagist, uh, that could have the same signing support as part of its infrastructure in the future. Yeah, so yeah, you might have to do some work on your side if you're running a private packagist. Um, but also, I think for some sites that do that, they may, you know, if you trust your hosting and your connection to the private packages much more than we can, you know, trust any generic Drupal or any generic hosting where somebody might be, then that might be an acceptable risk for you, for your connection to your particular private packages. I'm going to ask one more super, hopefully quick question. Um, and Matt, thank you for posting links to the core conversation. And if you could drop in the, the contribution or Slack links as well, that would be great. But, quickly, um, how much control will site owners have about, um, you know, choices to make on this process? Like, can they exclude paths that they're using for development purposes or different, like, how componentized and configurable do we expect this to be for folks' use, use cases? I think one thing that I don't think Core really can support is, like, having my thought is having like modules that are not installed via Composer. So um, if you have that, then your Composer lock is not accurately really reflecting, you know, what the current state of the site is. So determining whether something's compatible with the next version of core that we're going to install, or if it requires a dependency update, that that particular module people would be compatible would be really dangerous. So I think, um, I think w one thing that we will have to implement is a way to exclude things um, in from the composer staging process. Um, so I don't know if Travis can talk to that, but basically you don't want to copy over your site's default files because files may be added as content um, while you know you're doing the update and you don't want to copy them back. Also that could be a huge um, a huge number of files. So We'll have to support sort of the common use case and probably have a sort of similar API or sort of configuration where you can say also, you know, when you're copying over, this is not considered, this is not composer controlled, this particular folder. I 
I think um, to sort of help us wrap up, um, I'd encourage everyone who if who's interested in learning more about how this works um, to come to our technical overview later this afternoon. Um, it, it wasn't linked in the update email, but they've met, said they will mention it in the chat and it is listed on the automatic updates page. Um, the, the title is Automatic Updates Initiative Technical Overview and where you can help. So we'll, we'll talk more this afternoon about some implementation details and where we're heading next. We appreciate it and we'll see you at the contributions later today. And about DrupalCon. Thanks for all the questions. Thank you, everyone.